so bitte. Okay, so in today's workshop I'll be introducing you to CTFs. And as I introduce myself, I'm Abdullah Suleiman. I study computer science, uh, computer networks and security. So, um, we come from Malaysia. I do study in Malaysia and the University of Technology there. So, we wouldn't go into what is cyber security and a uh, few things here because <coughs> it's not just an oversight. So, we want to introduce CTF. What is CTF? CTF basically is uh, a very simple way that the people who are in the field of cyber security we're trying to teach people these skills in cyber security. How do we teach people um, how to hack or how to do these things ethically? Now it's so hard to tell people to hack PCs ethically, so they came up with something called GeoPredy CTF. GeoPredy CTF is a way of creating problems and then creating a secret key. This secret key is the solution to that problem. Now the thing is not about the secret key, the secret key is just a, it's just a thing. Um, they will give you a PC and they will put that key on the desktop like the password is, is going to be on the desktop They'll tell you hack that PC get that password submit it you get the points. So that's Basically in a very simple way what a CTF is um, Famous CTFs there there are Pico CTF, Google CTF, Facebook CTF Every company every person would, would create a CTF that's um, raised to him. There's there going to be challenges in different fields and each challenge as I told you, there's, go there's gonna be a flag and you have to get that flag. For example, they'll give you a capture packets of networks and in, that, in, that, in this capture of packets, there will be a packet sending that flag. So you will get that flag and you will submit it. So th the idea is not to get the flag, but how do you get it? How do you, how do you find that flag? They will hide a flag within a picture. How do you extract that flag from that picture? So, the fields of CTF are, uh, there are so many fields. Generally, in every competition, they will differ. Uh, you will find forensics, technography, binary exploitation, reverse engineering, uh, miscellaneous, I, I honestly don't know how to pronounce this. So, miscellaneous, or generally we call it general skill. You, it, it will be like the problem wouldn't be known, like it could be a programming problem, a general problem. And then the web application security. So, uh, be, before we get into that, sorry for stopping when, before it came back. So, uh, before we get into that, we need to, to tell you what a Linux is. So, uh, how to be a hacker, people would tell you like, buy that hoodie, get that dark screen, dark theme, and start coding. But that's, that's not how, how it is going. Linux is, is, is an operating system, and it's basically like Windows, like Mac OS, like any operating system in the world. Linux, uh, when we say terminal and Linux, you see people coding, it's nothing. The GUI, like people who created the GUI, when you, when you right click something, that's what I want to show you here. So, um, okay. This is my desktop. When I, when I come here, I will open my terminal here. Right click, open terminal, okay? So this is the, the hacker thing, the fancy thing, and this is my desktop. When I come here, I do right click, <coughs> new folder, a folder gets created, I say a name like test GUI, and then I press create. What do we see? We see a folder that, that has been created up there. Same thing, when you come to here, now I am in the root directory, I need to go to the directory of the desktop. So I'll change directory CD, desktop, I go to desktop. I want to make the same exact folder, a folder is a directory. I write the command make directory, and then test command line, cmd. And then I get another folder called test, test cmd. What I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say here is I'm trying to let you make sense of what a command line is. The GUI version, when you right click something, when you move the mouse, this is nothing. It's just a, a Photoshop. It's just a design. But when you actually click on that, the, the, the command make there is going to be executed. That's the same thing goes with, with Linux. Now, it's so easy to create programs with that, like when we see with people who program with C++ or Java, or these things, it's easy to make a command line program, and it could be very efficient, because you don't need to worry about the user experience, how the user will perceive the information, etc. So that's why people or hackers go into Linux, into command line, because tools are, there are so many tools, tools that are very easy to use, and they are made with command line. So that's, 
just the basic idea of making sense of, of Linux. Now, this command line could be extended to so many things. For example, we could create, uh, we could write something, we could search into a file, we could do so many things. So I will teach you very basic commands, the cat, the change directory, the, we teach you the make directory now, like how to create a directory or a file. Uh, we can now, for example, nano is a text editor. It, it, for example, when we come here and we, we try to, to search for a file, uh, gedit, just a text editor, it will open that way. So you can come from the command line as well and write gedit. That's, that's another text editor, it will open again. So the same exact thing, you search on GUI, you click, you're basically making that command, executing that command, but you're just telling if the mouse is clicking, then make execute that command. So it's an event-based uh, execution. So we can create a file, uh, apple, apple, another apple, no, orange, uh, Ali, Muhammad, whatever. So, we save this, we save it on the desktop, uh, Apple, whatever it is, good. So, let's close this, now the command line exited. So, what if we want to, to, to show that file, we, we, we use the word cat, which is a, a, a an, uh, an acronym for cat concatenate, and then we write scoot. So it will show us that thing. So what if, had a, if we had a file that, that has so many things, so many things, and we just want to get a word from that file, get just one word, the, the matching strings. We could make the same exact command, but the output of that, of that command, instead of directing it to the output screen, we could direct it to the command called grip, and then we grip for apple. So it will show us, it will show us that there is two, uh, uh, two apples. Now, this grip command is the same exact thing when we, when we press Control F and we find something on a page or something. So basically what I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to make sense of Linux, is that anything you see in the normal GUI with Mac, with Windows, even with Linux itself, you could do it with the GUI, you could easily do it with the command line, which is, I think, a better implementation if someone wants to do the, his things very fast. And the more you get into cybersecurity, the more you realize how, how, how good is that. So we have the cat, we have the grip, and we have the, the make file, and we have the echo last file. Echo is something that outputs to the screen, so we can write hello world. So it will give us to the output screen. Now we, there's something in Linux called redirecting the output. So we can press on this larger than, and it will redirect it to a file. If the file is there, and it's only one sign, it will overwrite it. If it doesn't exist, it will create it. So we don't have a file in this store, so hello world.txt. So we have it now in the store hello world.txt, we cat it, we, and it's hello world.txt. Uh, now what if we write something else again with the same thing? The file exists now, hello world exists, but we want, we're going to write will it append, like will it append or will it override that thing? We press enter and we cast hello world again and no, it didn't, it didn't happen, it, over, it overrode it. Because uh, what, what you see here, this larger than is only one. If you want to append, like you have something you want to put on the tail of that thing, you, you have to use the two, uh, the two larger than. Now the file has, will it append? And then we say yes, it will. And then we cat it. Will it happen? Yes, it will. It has appended it to that file. So these are a few very basic commands. Uh, I honestly don't want you to think to think of them like those are very fancy commands, very hard commands. Literally, it will take you one week. Keep doing them, and then suddenly they are in your mind and you remember them because they will be your your daily use. Uh, if you want to make files, cd, uh, okay, make directory, uh, test1, we go to that directory, cd test1, now we're going to make another directory, test2, or test3, so if you, if you want to get into that directory, we write the command cd, which is the same in Windows shell as well, 
and we, we go to that, uh, that file. So we have test one created, we get into it, we have a test three, and we have a test three. Same thing, when we double click and we get into the directory, it's the same exact thing when we write cd change directory. So that's what basically Linux is. I wouldn't go much as detail into this because uh, we are really running out of time and we have so many other things to, to cover today. So, this is the fancy hacking story. So when someone tells you hacking and he puts that hoodie on, know that this guy is a script kitty, like he knows no, nothing about hacking. Because basically, I myself prefer light team, not, not the dark team. So, yeah, we get into CTF. <coughs> we want to show you now a real example of CTF. So, as I told you, there's so many fields in the competition. I'll tell you something. We go to here. This is one of the most famous CTFs. It's meant for high school students. Pico CTF. Okay. Uh, it's done by Carnegie Mellon University for all students in the United States. So, once you get into that uh, website, I hope it loads. You have 19 and 18. So, I have it here. I'm doing it from my account because there is a few challenges that uh, Okay, they're all closed. So yeah, these are the challenges. You'll get to the, to, the, to the competition, you'll find so many questions. For example, when we talk about, we will come to cryptography. This is a, an example I want to show you, which is cryptography. So it will give you a question, decrypt this message, you can find the cyber text in, this is for the competition uh, server because it's played in two things, on a, in a shell game and uh, not interactively in the website. Decrypt this message, you can download this message, and it will give you a hint. And then that flag. When you get that flag, you submit it, you get these points. Because this question has 100 points, it tells you how many people did solve it. So, uh, the hint here that we have, Caesar Cypher tutorial. So it will give you a thing about Caesar Cypher. Now, what is Caesar Cypher, what is cryptography? That's what I'll show you. <coughs> Where did it go? cryptography is. Before, when people in 1970s, 1960s, people used to, to send an, an encrypted message to someone, it will be like this. Uh, for example, Raja is here. I'll tell him, hello, Raja. We will, um, we will agree on something. I will send you a letter, A, B, C, D, and I don't mean A, B, C, D. I mean that you, me, and Raja, we will, we will settle uh, and agree on something that Raja will rotate every single letter two digits. So, when I send him A, B, C, D, the A, Raj knows that he has to shift it two digits. It's gonna be A, B is gonna be C. And then B is gonna be E, let's say, like two digits, two digits. He will shift them digit by digit, digit by digit, until he gets the encrypted message. So, that's what we call a symmetric uh, cryptography. There is two types of crypto cryptography, the symmetric and the asymmetric. The symmetric is what has been used before, which is that we will agree on a key of decryption, and you will have that key, I'll have that key, and we will use it. So, this is how, how it's done in a, in a GIF. We will agree on the same key, we will rotate by 13, which is my thing. Alice and Bob, the most famous example in computer science. We will send the cipher text that we encrypted with a secret key, and then he will use the same secret key to decrypt it. Now, this is a good thing of, of, of decrypting, but it has a problem. The problem is that me and Raja, we have to be physically connected. We have to be physically in the same place. Now, what if Raja was in another country or another place? How can we communicate? What if the communication is not secure between us? So, this became a problem. So, people came with a very genius way, which is the, the public key encryption or the asymmetric encryption. Now, asymmetric encryption, public key, private key, you will see it a lot. It's very simple, very, very simple. In a state, let me just go to that. Uh, in a state of, imagine the secret key as a lock. Lock, you know lock, and that lock has a key. So, I will create seven locks, seven locks, and I'll have one key to all of them. I am the only one who has the key. I'll send the locks to everyone who wants to send me a message. He will put his message, he will lock his key, and
and he will send me. Who is the only one who can open it? Me, because I'm the only one who has the key. So that's the idea of public key cryptography. You have, you generate two types of keys, a private key and a public key. The private key is something you have it with you. And the, the, the public key is the thing that the other person would have. So your public key, everyone sees it. So if someone wants to send me a message, he will see my public key. He can only see my public key. He will take my public key, he will encrypt the message with my public key, with my lock, and then he'll send me the message. Now I'm the only one who have that, that lock to my key. And then that key could be exchanged in, in, in different uh, algorithms. One of the most famous is Diffie-Hellman. And this is incredibly amazing because there is no way that you can decrypt the key, at least in, 2000, in 2020. You see, like, let me introduce, this is two <coughs> keys. He will give him his public, uh, yeah. This is his public key, he will encrypt it with it, and then he can open it with his uh, private key. Now this is genius because of one thing. You can never guess the private key of someone. You can never guess that private key. And the way of generating this is that they will use the, the, the specifications of the prime numbers and you will have almost like uh, 64 times 64 digits prime number, which is impossible for a PC to, to factorize in, in 2022. It will take it like 300 or 3,000 years, something like this. So, uh, that was it, so we will talk now with something, we will do a, a, what we call it, a light example of that question. So this is my terminal, this is a Kali Linux. I forgot to tell you about Kali Linux. So, basically Kali Linux is an operating system. You see Samsung, Andro Android phones, you will find every company, when, when they give you their phone, they will install a few um, a few tools for the, for the for for their company. But these tools you might not need, you might you might not need them. For example, Google, they will install install for you Google Docs, Google Slides, Google Sheets, whatever the thing. If you buy a phone from Google, now you might not need this. You can delete it, but it's good that the company will install it for you so you can use it. Same thing goes with with operating systems. Kali Linux is the same exact Linux operating system based on a Debian operating system. Now. People will take it, they will install all the cybersecurity tools that you might need in your life. When they install these cybersecurity tools that you might need in your life, you don't need to go and find on the internet, I need to download this, download this, download this. It will be a pain. So they will gather it all for you, and you can use them. Here you see information gathering, vulnerability analysis, web application, database, repeating tools, forensics, uh, brute forcing, there's so many tools. So that's just the idea of of that thing. So, uh, for the cryptography, <coughs> as I showed you, see the cipher is just something uh, when we done. Okay, let's. Okay, it's not getting big. Uh, let's just do it here. This is the terminal. You guys can see, right? Okay. So, see the cipher is basically th that's the file, by the way. The file was like this, pico cpf, which is the flag format. So this is the file. So see the cipher is basically that, we, as I told you, we will agree on something. We will agree on, rot on rotating the letters with a specific digits. So with see the cipher, there is no way to guess that rotation because uh, you will agree on it. You don't know what, what, what that rotation is. So we might agree that we can shift two digits, we can shift three digits, four digits, and from that Caesar cipher, we'll find another cipher example that are based on the same concept. There is one of the most famous thing is ROT13. ROT13 is a cipher that <coughs> just rotates the digits by 13. Now why 13? Because the alphabet is 26 and 13 is a good, is a very good rotation for letters. So we have this, uh, this flag, and we want to decrypt it. So I created a tool for you guys. You can find it on my GitHub rep repository. Uh, that tool will allow you to rotate anything. So let's just copy this thing. I think I copied it back. Yeah, it's my clipboard. So uh, we go to CD tools. These are the tools. C I call it CTF rotator. So we come to that tool, we have we have, it's made by Python, so this is the rotator just by, this is the, the, the tool. I made a, a shell script that will automatically run it. So when you first download it, I, I wrote in the instructions, you change mode. I already changed mode. 
to make it executable. And then now we want to run it. Once we run it, God, don't do this. No, no, no. Okay, it's there. So uh, that's it's called rotator. So it lets you decode by ten rotations, like you know, like you want to rotate by thirteen, by fourteen, by fifteen, by three, by two. You can use this and you can copy or show all the twenty-six possible rotations. Means it will show you. The, the sample text after one digit, two digit, three digit, four digit, five digit. So we can use the show, show all two possible combinations because we honestly don't know what that combination is. So when we make it here, it will do it from 0 to 25, the index. And we, we, we look at these things, they are all, uh, oh, they are all like, you know, uh, bullshit. And the only thing that makes sense here is this one, the 22 one, which is crossing the Rubik uh, converged XL, whatever it is. So that, that's in English, it makes sense. You realize this is the message. So you copy that message, and you go back to the same place that we got our PPC here from. Is it here, is it here? See the cipher? When you read about it, it will tell you the same thing. They will shift. The same thing, when you go to the challenge, you solve it that way. Pico, Pico CTF, and you paste it, and then you click submit. Now, just to tell you that every competition will have their own flag format. BCA CTF, uh, Pico CTF, Google CTF. Generally, it all goes by the, just a tradition with people who care CTF. They go by Pico CTF, then the curly braces, and then the flag. So once we submit, Flag correct, however, you have already solved this case. <coughs> so that's the story with cryptography. As we said, asymmetric and symmetric. This was an example of symmetric cryptography, which people don't use now. But it's good to know. Uh, another thing that we need to go in is the web exploitation, which is here. So when we go to web exploitation, this is a very good technique because with web exploitation, you can train yourself to be a pen penetration tester, which is in other words, an ethical hacker. So, with web exploitation, uh, you, you will, they will give you websites and you need to find things about websites. So, uh, this is a question about robots.txt that I want to do, which is from PicoCTF as well. It says, where are the robots? But let me just put uh, categories only on your web exploitation because I just want to see them. So we have open to admins, we have where are the robots. So the question is answered. Can you find the robots? And they'll give you the, 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 the link. You press on it to go to it. This is the link, I have opened it. So where are the robots? And then you, they'll give you a hint. So what part of website could tell you where the creator doesn't want you to look? So the way that you approach this problem is that you will write in Google robots website, something like this. And then you will find in Google people talking about a file called robots.txt, which is basically that every, yeah, the web robots page, the web robots page, introduction to robots, stuff like this. So basically, uh, the people, uh, Google, have something called Crowder. The Crowder is the thing that, the search engine that will, uh, will show your web page on, on the Google search. So, in order for Google to, to do this, they will index everything in your website. Now, sometimes there are parts of your website that maybe only for admins or only for people that, uh, that have an access. You don't want a crowdler to access that. So, there is a file called robots.txt that will disallow that, that crawler from getting into uh, your website. So, Basically, you will always find at, at a slash robots.txt and whenever you do a penetration testing, you will find it there. And it's a good thing to look for it because that, that part, uh, the, the developer doesn't want you to look at it. So we go to robots.txt, we hit enter, and it's a user agent, star, which means, star means all. So this allows all user agents from accessing 0.19.48.html, which is an HTML page that has a flag in it. So we will we know that the developer doesn't want Google to access that, that page. So why they don't want it to access that page? We'll see now. We go back, we copy it, 
we don't do that. Okay, so we copied it and then we press enter and guess you found the robot. Uh, yeah, calculating mechanics, something like this. So you copy that, you go back to the people CTF and you have the solved part, you submit your flag, it will be up there that it has been solved. So that's what is the what are the robots. Now another uh, another co uh, question that we will go to is uh, yeah is uh, uh, client side, which I will come to into this way. So web pages, how do they work in a very simple way? Is that every developer will create three exact files, an HTML page, which is a page that will say I have a box. And in this box, for example, I'm creating a button, okay? So I'll create a box and I'll say, uh, button one, I will write it. So with HTML, I create the box, I write inside of, it, inside of it a button. Now, how to make that button look cool? How to color it? How to make it, uh, how to make the, the, the edges curvy or something like this? So you will use something called CSS, <coughs> cascading style sheet. So with CSS, you can, you can make the button look, look better. And now, how do we make the website redirect us to another page once we click on that button? We use a JavaScript. So every single website in the world is just these three things. The CSS, the JavaScript file, and the HTML. The HTML is the data, CSS is the, the style, and JavaScript is the functionality. You press, it takes you, you press, it shows you, you press, it rotates something, whatever it does, that's the functionality with JavaScript. So, the way that these, how do you access a web page is that you are the client and this is the server. So, every uh, website is stored in a web server. Web server is nothing, just maybe another PC with high uh, spe specifications like high RAM, high CPU, something like this. So, you are the client, you will send in the network something called the GET request. It goes away, huh? Okay, that's the get request. It will go to that website, get me that HTML file that we have just talked about. Uh, you, will, you will assign the headers, the things that you need to have, the ID, the stuff like this, and then the website will see the get request. If he has it, he will send you a 200. The server will find it, it, it will send you this. Okay, I got this page, take it, and then your web browser is gonna compile that page and show it to you the, the, that, that web page of Facebook or of Google. Now, if you, saw, if you see there, it's to be 1.1, that's the version, and then 200, okay. 200 means that that web page exists on the server. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen 404 before, right? 404 not found. It's just a, a way that the server will tell the client that that web page doesn't exist, I don't have it. So it will send it a 404 not found. That's why you see 404 not found on your website because basically the server sent that, uh, that, that uh, client that I don't have that page. So we, we go back again to the, to, the, to the competition and we have, for the web exploitation, we have client side. So can you break into, sup in this super secure, into this super secure portal and it will give you a link? I'll give you a hint. Never trust the client, which is your first rule in, in programming. Never trust the client. So, it will tell you this is a secure login portal, enter this thing, this thing, you will enter something, verify, and it will tell you incorrect password. So, how do we know that this is the correct password? We go to inspect element, which is another way of showing what was that HTML file that we get from the server. So, we see that that's the HTML code, and we see there's a script here. I hope I can, okay. This is the script. So that's the script. If you see here, uh, do you guys can't see it properly. Okay, copy. So basically this website is checking for a password on the client side. As I told you, there's a client and there's a server. So 
when you want that client to enter his password, you need to check if that, if that password is true. Now, the, the idea here is that you never trust the client, is that you never implement that website on the client side. So, they implement that check if the substring uh, from zero to split is four. So, if that string from zero to four is Pico, and then from six, uh, sorry, from four times six, which is 24, to four times seven, 28, it will keep checking if it's equal to this string, and if they are making it on the client side, so you are the client, you get here, they are checking of my string, if my string from index 24 to 26 is this, 28 to 20 to 32 is this, then I can make something very good here. I can make something like this, and then I'll, I'll do something like this. Split is four, so zero to four is P2. Now, uh, split times six, four times six, 24. Two, uh, four times seven, 28. What is this? It's six, six, eight, six, eight, eight, E. And, and so on and so forth. Split is four, split times two is eight, four to eight is this, uh, C, P, F. So we will keep doing this, we will, we will think about it and the, we will find that the, the, the flag from zero to four is P code, then four to eight is C, P, F. We will rearrange it and you will get the flag. So uh, basically it's no client please. So the thing here that we have to learn is that you never implement uh, something on the client side. The second problem that we have to go to is another thing which the same the same exact problem. They, they call it even like client side again. So client side again. So what is obfuscation? So when you Google obfuscation, what is that? You find that sometimes when you have to implement a code on the client side, you need to make that code look very ugly and very stupid which is the, the, the technique of obfuscation. The code is the same exact as it is. Uh, variable, for example, client name, <coughs> variable client password. You will obfuscate it by calling the client name variable as x, y, z, h, p, c, d, like a very long variable that, that will, will give a headache to, to the person who is uh, trying to, to hack that website. So that website, if you want to go to it, as I showed you just now, the code was very, was very clear. That one. It's very clear, just a normal JavaScript. Anyone can understand this. But when we go here, new and improved login. Enter various credentials. And you come here, check what you see with the script. It's just something that we have no idea what is that. Zero, X, two, B, C, D, F. They will, they will submit it to something and that something is just gonna make it look very weird so the person who's trying to read this would, would, would face problems reading it. So it's a way of obfuscation. Everyone does that, Google, Facebook. If you try and reverse an Instagram or try to, to look into the code of Facebook, you will find that it doesn't make any sense because basically they are doing an obfuscation. It's a good way but it's not like very secure. The most secure way is that you never check the password on the client side. Let the the, the client himself send you to the password to your server and on your server you can check for it, sanitize it and then return back, you can enter or you can't, uh, you can't enter that website. So the last thing which will be practical, the user agent. Yeah, the user agent is basically your, your, your web browser. As I told you before, just now, with the robots, they disallow every user agent. So if we go back here, oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, with this one, if you go back, we see here user agent Mozilla. Every time you send a request to a server, I want to access that web page, I want to do this, they will have that user agent thing, your Mozilla. So, uh, when you look into the web, into, into to that question <coughs> that we have, okay, that question. We have, what was it? Big group browser. So, this website can be rendered only by Pico browser. Means that any browser is disallowed to this. So, if we want to do this, let me do it on the Linux because I have this. Okay, let's just copy the link. Uh, copy link location. We 
people here, thanks for asking, sir. And this is our desktop. We go here, we search for Firefox, we go to there. Now this is the website. Okay, sorry. This is <laughs> me making the, the, the proxy. Okay, so here we will be using a tool called Verb Suite, I believe. So, Verb Suite is nothing, it's just a tool, a very important tool made by people uh, to allow you to view that, to intercept that request. When you send that request to that web page, I don't want to update now, when you send that uh, request to that web page, you can actually intercept it in the, in the between and change it. So if we run this, start verb, we want to access that website. First we, we have here the proxy, we, is, the intercept is on. We are intercepting each request. So just look at it when we, when we try to access that website, what we're doing basically is, okay, let's just add an exception because, yeah. This is my verb. I forward the request. Yeah, this is the request. Get problem 325 HTTP shell. User edit is Mozilla 5.0. So when I try to forward that request, let's just send it to repeater. Uh, when I try to forward that request, it, it sends me nothing my new website. When you try to access the flag, it wouldn't give you the flag. Now, you can actually change that request. So we can come here to the user agent. Instead of adding Mozilla, Firefox, this thing, we can make it Pico Browser. <coughs> now, what happens when we forward that request? Okay, so let's intercept that request. We want to get to the flag. We press the flag. Let's press on flag. Once we, we, we press, we are trying to access the flag, but we have uh, user agent is Mozilla. We forward, it's nothing. It give us, it's giving us nothing. Now, what if you want it to give us the flag, actually? We create another request. We change the user agent from Mozilla to Peak Browser. And this is not working, by the way, because when you try to set up uh, Verb suite in your, in your uh, PC, it will take some time to set up the proxy and to install the certificate, which is what I didn't do. It's loading. Up there, it's loading. Pico CTF, Pico Secret Agent. So sometimes when you try de dealing with web, trying to hack a website or something, that website will just allow user user agents. You can change a user agent. You can even inject a command in that user agent. Inject something called CRLF injection cross uh, carriage return line feed. So basically, here's that you guys should know that user agent is always sent. Once you send the request to the web browser, like I want to access that, that, that web page, you will tell, tell that, that web server that I am, I am Google Chrome, I am Mozilla Firefox, I am, I am, I am. And that web server will check if he doesn't like Mozilla people, if maybe he didn't like prepare his scripts to run on Mozilla, but they can run on Chrome. So he, he can't give you back because he knows that it, it won't work uh, well on, on your web browser. So that's what we have here. We go to, to the office. Yeah. It's from there. We submit it here, the Pico browser. And so you, you get the, the rhythm of, 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 of CTFs. It's just problems related to cybersecurity. Each problem, the way you solve it is you go you Google anything in that problem. Anything you can Google it, you just Google it. Just write it in Google. You will always find something related. Something will lead to something, something will lead to something, and then you will build experience into, into that thing. So I think now we have finished uh, web exploitation tutorials. 
which is what I was trying to say is that with the user agent, with uh, robots.txt, every website behaves in a certain way. So when it behaves in that certain way, you can understand that way and then you can, you can try to find your, your way in into that website. Now, as I told you, people who make these CTFs, they don't want you to hack the website because there is no point. But they will put something in that website and they will tell you hack to get that thing, which is the flag. So you hack, you change the user agent, you find the robots, and then you take that flag and you submit it. So that way, they taught you how to actually build a secure website, uh, how to actually hack a website without making harm to any, to any person. Now we go to, to the amazing uh, field that I, I honestly like is steganography. Steganography is basically hiding things into image. Now, as we know, as we all know you, I think you all guys are computer science students. So in computer science, everything is zeros and ones. Everything is bits, basically. Anything goes back to the deep down level, it's just zeros and ones. Network packets, pictures, music, video, anything is just a zeros and ones. So the images as well as zeros and ones. Now, what if we can hide something? Every image is like, every image has like a, a byte. So byte next to a byte next to a byte next to a byte. Now, what if we changed the very last uh, bit of that byte. The byte is 8 bits. We just change a very slight thing in every and each byte. Nobody will notice that on the picture. The picture will look very normal. But when someone applies some steganography tools on it, he can see the message. And this is used widely. So let's show you a live demo, demo of steganography. What do we mean by steganography? We have ended up with verb suite. We came back to our shark and web in a second. So yeah, this is steganography. That was a question that we had in a competition, in Asia Pacific University competition last uh, semester. So we had that question. Yeah. Okay. So we have a, a music called All Stars Smash Mark, something like this. We just had this question and they say it is the flag. So me and my team, we spend like one hour trying to listen to the, mu to, to the music and let me just try to make it run here. Oh. It's just a, a song. So we have been trying to reverse it all the way and like maybe they're hiding a flag inside, maybe they are talking about something and then we Google and then we find the lyrics and we couldn't find the flag. But then we thought this song, this MP3 has a picture, right? What if they have something inside of that picture? Because the competition was a steganography, steganography field. So they have to hide something in a picture. So we, we just had this one. So we run a tool, as I showed you, it's a very, a very easy tool. Not a GUI tool, just a command line tool called Binwalk. It's just a program. Someone made that program called Binwalk. So Binwalk is a program that will allow you to extract so many things. If you write it, this is all the options you can do. The dash W, dash G, dash I, these options that will allow the program to make something. And instead of clicking on that option, you just write it in your command, dash W, dash, it's the same exact thing as clicking on it. So with Binwalk, we can see what exists in that, in that file. So, what we find here is that there's a PNG image and this is the compressed data. So that image maybe has meaning to us. So we want to extract it. So to extract this bin walk, as we've seen here, you guys see, here there's so many options. Extract, and then dash D for the type, and then Matryoshka, which is a Russian doll that's like something inside something. Uh, and then the size, the RM, the car. There's so many options that I honestly don't have no idea about uh, most of them. I only use the things that like uh, will help me. So we can use the same exact command again, but we just specify an option dash d and we okay dash d and then we tell it to ex to extract a PNG. A PNG. It's the same exact thing as imagine the program and you're clicking on that option to extract a PNG. It's just an easy way of doing it with command line. You don't have to worry about uh, the event. So we do 
that, and it has uh, it has compressed it to us. And then when we use it, we have the folder that's uh, underscore or star. So cd change directory. We go to that file, and then we have four eight seventy three and one one five. That's okay. You can see it. We have the four eight seventy three and seventy three dot zip. So uh, we 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 just want to know what is that four eight. So it's a PNG image. So in steganography, as I told you, people are just changing very small things that it doesn't affect the whole picture. That you can see the whole picture, and there is no difference. Just a normal cat, just a normal picture. But you actually know that there is a very small bit inside that's been hidden. And then how to extract that? How do people know uh, what's been hidden inside that picture? Is that they will increase the brightness, increase the ex decrease the exposure, do stuff like this. Uh, extract the red alone, the G alone, the blue alone, and then find the, the data inside of this. So, with that PNG image, file for A, there is a very good tool called StigSol. So, I think it's in. Yeah. Uh, this StigSol could be downloaded from the internet. So, just a normal program to do a stenography thing. So we try to open that image we just extracted, which is in desktop, Pico, but it's not Pico though. Stenography, and then Nya 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 Nya, which was the competition uh, uh, question name, and that song that we have extracted. <coughs> that's appearing here. And then that, that image that we have just seen for it. So that's the image it has opened, a very cool image. Now, as I told you, they are just changing very small bits inside that image. Images byte, 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 byte. They will change if the number of bits is like 100, and you know that the last bit is one, right? The, 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 the most right bit is one. So 100 and 101 is the same thing. When you have a picture of one million bits, if you, if you are changing it to 99, 99, Nine, 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 nine bits. Uh, there is no difference because one million, there's so many bits that it, it wouldn't even appear. So people who try to decrypt the message now, they will have that thing. If you see there, color inversion. They will make an XOR for each uh, bit. Then this thing, and then the alpha plane six, alpha plane five, four, three, two, one. And then they will make it black and white, change the exposure, do so many things. And then we get the flag. APU Battle of Hackers 2019, somebody hit the flag. So, that's basically what the stenography is. Now, how can you do this? How can you send a message to your friend uh, doing this? Oh my god, we run out of time. Okay, so basically there are so many tools to do this. There's a stick, uh, oh, sorry. There's so many tools. There is a, a tool called Stick Hide that can, can that we can use it here, but we wouldn't go into it because we are really running out of time, and I want to cover as much as possible today. So the third part that we will, sh as I showed you, stenography is about that. You can just Google how to do stenography. On YouTube, you will find so many tutorials. It's just an easy way. You can uh, there's a tool called Stick Hide, and you just uh, give it to the, the thing that you want to hide. You can hide it. And just one more thing I want to mention about stenography is that when do they use it? Now, in Norway, the police, uh, they had a case where there, like, there, there were four people did something like this. So they, they wanted to send the pictures of that case into the victim's families. But they told them never 
publish this. This is not for the public. You can only see it. Now, because the police are smart, they know some people would publish that. So they have hidden, like if I'm giving this to Rajah, I'm giving the picture to Rajah, I'll hide uh, Rajah's name in that picture that I gave to him. And then I'm giving to A and uh, I'll put his name on the picture. B put his name on the picture and give it to them. And then if one picture is published to the web, I do my stenography test and I see the name. So I know who is the person who leaked this. And this actually happened and the Norway police caught the people who leaked the pictures and he's in jail now, uh, probably. Now we go to forensics. Uh, forensics is the science of Detective Conan. It's just being a detective. Uh, the company has been hacked and you don't know what happened before the hack, so you will start to analyze everything, analyze the network, analyze, 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 and then you will find useful information that you try to make sense of. So, the example of forensic that we will try to make here as fast as possible is with Wireshark. Wireshark, I'm sure, who here took data communication subject? Yeah. Okay, so I'm sure you all guys know Packet Tracer, Wireshark, things like this. So, we are here. So we have a, a challenge called Sharp on the Wire. It's what, it was on PPCTF. The hint was, uh, what was the hint? Yeah, <coughs> what are the streams? So we run Wire Sharp here, which is a tool I'm sure all of you know it. And then we try to open the file and then we have this capture file. So we have so many data inside, so many packets, but how can we how can we find them? So we look for the UTP packet, because there was no uh, TCP or HTTP packet. And then we go to this UTP, and then we go to the stream, because the, the hint was what are the streams. So we try to follow the UTP stream. So when we follow the UTP stream, we have stream four, stream, this is stream one. If you see it's down there, this is stream one. So basically, we have analyzed the network, like some breach happened in the, in the company and we are analyzing that network. So we are trying to see what happened, who sent to who, who accessed what. So we go into the stream, we see every single stream, so many questions, and then Pico CTF statistics. We have that flag in the packet, and then Pico CTF, not a flag, and then so many other, other things. So in forensics, you will be given a, uh, a, certain, a certain condition, and with that condition, uh, you, will be, you will be able to analyze it. They will give you a, a capture of packets, they will give you, uh, in one competition I, I remember, they gave us a hard drive. Like they say that this, comp this company was hacked, take that hard drive image and look. And then you try to look like the user, what did he access before the company was hacked, from which, from which PC, the, the hack came from, and stuff like this. So this is just the art of forensics. Forensics, is, as I told you, just about being a detective, thinking like a detective, what happened, when, and then try to use the tools that you have to analyze that, that thing. Now, sorry for running fast, but I have to cover the last two things, just to give you an idea about them, which are the buffer overflows and the reverse engineering part. Uh, these are the toughest part in, in cyber security. And literally, the people who are outside working with that, they're like just 1% one, 1 or 2%, because it's a very tough, sub, tough uh, subject. Uh, basically, buffer overflow, how does it happen? Is that when we, you guys uh, programmed with C++ probably. So with C++, we know that we need to manage memory, allocate memory. So the memory, how uh, everything, every program you run in your PC is, is basically laid out in your RAM. That's the RAM. So inside the RAM you have this amazing thing. It starts from zero of the address until all F. And what we have is this, on top of it we have the, the operating system. We don't touch that. Here we have the text, which is the program that's trying to run, like C out, C in. We don't touch that, it's just the code. And then the data, and then the heap, and the stack. Now each function you call is called into the stack. Each function, main function, uh, swap, whatever the function is, the function will be put into the stack. So that's how it's going to be put. The function variables will be on top, and then we will have the buffer which, where the function will perform its calculations, and then we have the return that will take us back from where we call the function. For example, 
we are trying to call a function multiply. We are in main, we, we are right at here, we are calling uh, multiply 5 and 2. So we call it, we want to go back and finish the program. So that return address will take us back once we finish all the calculations in the stack to here. Now what is buffer overflow? What does it have to do with, sta with stacks? Is that the way? The buffer is a specific uh, size of memory that has been allocated to that function. Now, you could give that buffer. Now, what if you have given that buffer a data that's more than that? It will overflow. Basically, think about it as a, a cup of water and you're pouring water inside of it. It will overflow. So that's what happens with memory, is that sometimes you have a buffer and you can overflow that buffer. How do you overflow that buffer? It's just by sending the input to the stack more than what, what, what the buffer has. So that's how it happens, and you go here. Now this is the return address. Where does the buffer overflow attack come? Is that <coughs> that address, you, 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 could, you could, for example, at the beginning of that program, you could put a malicious code. And then, at the end of these A's, instead of putting an A, you put the address of that malicious code. So instead of this return, returning to, the, to, to where you call it, to the main, it will return here. And then your, your, uh, your malicious code is going to be executed, and then you, you have hacked that, that application. Now, buffer overflows and stack overflows are very common. I'm sure anyone in computer science knows the website called Stack Overflow. That's where it came from. That's the idea of Stack Overflow, is that the, the size of the stack isn't as, mu as much big as it has to be. So this was a, a competition uh, problem. Uh, th this is the buffer, 64 uh, bytes. And then if modified equals to this, which this is in hexadecimal, 61 is A, oh sorry, D, C, B, A, something like this, like letters. 61 is a letter, 62 is a letter, 63, which is from the ASCII map. And if, if, you, if you make that modified into this, it will give you how correctly you get the variable. If, it, if it's like uh, not in that, in that uh, data, it will tell you to try again. So, we're trying to buffer overflow this. How we do this? We know that this buffer is 64. So we send more than the 64, it will overflow to that variable and it will change it. So, this is the ASCII values. If you see up there with hexadecimal, 61 is A, 62 is B, 63 is C, 64 is D. Now, you will find that we have, when we try to make the thing, we, we, we run the program, but we give it a DCBA. But it, it was 61, right? So it should be ABCD. Now that's another thing with stacks is that there is something called the little Indian and the big Indian. Now, this is a very funny story. It's basically that before, and uh, is that when you, when, you, when you put something into the memory, do you put it from right or from, from left? And big Indian, little Indian is that there's few people in the world who were arguing about the boiled egg. Do they, do they put it on the very little end of that weight or on the big end of it? So that's the convention with, with memory. Some people will use uh, little Indian and some people will use big Indian. Most of Intel will use uh, little Indian, which is from right to left. That's why we, we put it on the reverse. We put it DCBA instead of ABCD. So once we put it, we see down, you have correctly changed the program to the right value. So as I, sh as I was saying, buffer overflows is nothing. Think about it as this. You're giving it a size, and you have something more than that size. So you, you send it, and when it overflow, you can just control it, and then you can make something out of it. That's what a buffer overflow is. And uh, there's a, a link in Stack Overflow, an article that will help you understanding it more. Now, the last thing is reverse engineering, which I'll just talk about the idea of it. Reverse engineering is just like the mechanical guy. Basically, in life, we get to see, for example, a desktop or something that we don't have the catalog of how to install it. But it is installed. So we try to, to take it out, disassemble it, and then look at it, and then, oh, now I understand how this works. With the mechanic, same thing. Maybe he gets the car, he doesn't have the catalog. But he starts like disassembling, taking a screw out, putting another screw, sees what happened, and then he understands, oh, this works that way. Same thing with computer science or cybersecurity. 
you will have a program, and that program will make certain things. So you try to put an input like this, an input like this, an input like that, and then you try to understand what that program is, how it's behaving. And based on that behavior, you try to hack the program, and you get to, to hack it. I am so sorry for going that very fast. We have just finished. So any questions? Thank you very much, guys. I honestly try to give you as much information as you could rather than just focusing on, on a specific question because uh, it's just an introduction, just you to get to know what are these things. But later on, uh, I'll, I'll pass my email to, to Muhammad and then he can pass it to you and if you guys have any like uh, questions, where could I start? Uh, let me just show you one last thing. Please guys, take, take note of this, please. Okay, so, important, so, YouTube, John Heyman. John Heyman is a very guy who helps in introduction, introducing people to this. And then another website, Google it. Pico, CTA, that we have just been doing this. <coughs> How the, how the question is solved, Google for this, like example, any CTF, example CTF, and then write ups. So the write up is where you find how this question was solved. So YouTube John Hammond is a person that will literally teach you how to, how to solve these problems, how to, how to get started with them. He has solved Pico 19, I believe, and 18 as well, 17 as well. And yeah, these are the most important sites to get you started on the, on the right track. Now, I wanted to talk something about buffer overflows. One last thing. You guys all have studied something called data structures and algorithms, and I'm sure you guys knew something about uh, binary search. So binary search is basically a technique where you will have it. So let's just Google something. Binary searching slide, any slide. So we saw here, I remember I found the slide. It was in my university as well. Okay. So this is what, this is Yang, from Washington University. You go to binary search PowerPoint, let's open it. Because you might see buffer overflow, like where could this happen? And let me tell you where exactly <coughs> could this happen. This is the slides. You see people here are saying min, min, integer min, equal min plus max divided by two. This is wrong. It is actually the same thing. But with that min plus max, if that thing overflows, it could cause an overflow. And then you can, like, you can play with that program and make it uh, harmful to the user, or like exploit that program. So buffer overflows are very wide and they're very common, and programmers always make that mistake because they don't have the basic understanding of cybersecurity and, and the buffer overflows. So when you guys do binary search trees in any company, please make sure you don't do it min plus max. It's, it, it will be like that way. That way. Min, plus max over two. It's gonna be min plus max over two. It will give you the same output, but it will prevent, uh, prevent buffer overflows. So buffer overflows, although they look like very horrible memory thing, but they are very common. Um, I, find it, I found it on my university slide. I asked the doctor and I told him, could it be a, a buffer overflow there? And he told me yes. And then I was trying to search for other universities and yeah, they teach it that way. Now it's not a problem to teach it that way, to just to introduce the concept, but they should teach them buffer overflows and secure programming. Actually, by the way, the buffer overflows occur only in C and very low level languages. So exactly. Only ones have uh, another have line of defense for such. Ex exactly. Exactly. When you when you talk about, but with Java you can have a buffer overflow as well. It's not like uh, just. Uh, you can find it. You can find it on on, on Hacker Rank at YouTube. The woman who is explaining, cracking the code interview, she have explained that there could be an overflow occurring in Java as well. So it's not tied to C and C++, C++ but generally why we say we see in C and C++ because it's the only language that you need to take care of the memory yourself. Sorry for taking your time. Thank you very much. I'm very glad for coming today. And if, there's, or if there are any questions, please feel free to ask tools, ways, things. Uh, if you want that rotating uh, tool, it's on my github, this column slash Abdullah Suleiman slash CTF rotator. I've made it available there.
you guys can uh, access it. That's all for today. Thank you very much. You. I really appreciate you coming today, guys. I'm sorry for being very fast. I had to wrap all this in one hour.
الفرق بين هات هاي بين Huh? 